Man, Aaron, I never thought we'd have a show about crying children. Uh, I'm not sure where to go with this one. And it's a story <laughs> he's never even told. Yeah, we got another kind of world premiere, right? We Last last episode, we got Ronquist telling us that he was moving over to Drake. And then this one, we, we got a story from Jake that, you know, he said he'd only told us in the whole world, yeah. which is pretty cool. And I, I've heard a lot of stories from Jake about his dad over the years, but uh, I had never heard that one. So that that was really kind of kind of wild to have it come out organically like that. And uh, I think yeah. most of us who had par- had fathers or parents who took us hunting and fishing remember the disappointment when we got left at home. Um, and, and boy, Jake, uh, when he told that story, you could you could feel it if you'd been there or even close to it. Took us to that moment. We had Jake Latondras on, and he is a kind of pro- prolific filmmaker does does Bassmaster and a bunch of different hunting and and sporting films all over the world just we could have talked to him for for hours and hours he also owns kind of interestingly a, a bar in Fort Collins Colorado that I knew as a as a younger person and you know it's kind of a staple in Fort Collins Colorado and being a Coloradan you know a lot of people know and the way that I knew that you knew him was interesting it was in Jim Ronquist's you know garage there was a town pump sticker on the fridge and we're in Sudgard, arkansas and i'm like how in the hell would you have a town <laughs> pump sticker on your fridge absolutely and i told you i said we're gonna have that guy on the podcast one day so uh yeah. it, it's funny how small the world gets so so often i think the older you get the the smaller it gets it seems um, and folks aren't going to want to miss how he got his start. That was a pretty cool, you know, in, in photography and cinematography. That was one of the, the better stories I've heard in a while. Yeah, a, a guy from Camden, Tennessee, and, and to get into ice climbing and stuff, it's like, how in the world did this even happen? So to hear it all come together is pretty amazing. Well, the good news was he's he followed his heart to the outdoors like a lot of us do, so... Enjoy this one, folks. Jake Latondras. Since 1936, the National Wildlife Federation has worked with hunters and anglers to pass the most important conservation laws in American history and to protect our sporting traditions. This podcast explores our history, our values, and the work we do to safeguard the fish and wildlife that fuel our passions. We are nwf outdoors hey everyone and welcome to the nwf outdoors podcast with your host aaron kendall and me bill cooksey aaron how's it going today i'm good man i i just returned from kentucky where i did the bourbon tour so i'm a little still a little slow i might be i might be taking a break from bourbon for a while but it was (laughs) awesome it, it sounds awesome, believe it or not, and I've never done this before. I gave up uh, whiskey for Lent, and so I have until tomorrow, and I have not had any whiskey for a month now. Wow, uh, good on you. Yeah, Everybody so, needs a little break, moderation. Everything in moderation, even moderation once in a while. That's right. I'll, <laughs> I'll de-moderate uh, tomorrow evening for sure. <laughs> nice. But, l- let me tell you about the guy we have on today. Um <clears throat> He's been a friend of mine for about 25 years now, I guess, uh, from Tennessee, but uh, where normally you hear me get a guy from the east and Aaron will get guys from out west as guests. He lives in Fort Collins, Colorado, and has for about 30 years, 35 years maybe. Um, Jake Latondres, he's from, as I said, Camden. He lives in Fort Collins. He owns the Town Pump Bar there. But the reason he's here today is he's also a very – well-known videographer in the industry and a big outfitter and his story uh, is just amazing and inspirational jake has filmed in 49 countries he's had seven trips to africa he films all the bassmaster elite events um, he's worked with our friend ramsey russell on its duck season somewhere and videoed all over the world with him he's uh he owns prairie rock outfitters in nebraska and also has worked with us on several NWF and Vanishing Paradise videos, notably the Mississippi River Delta video in Louisiana. And we're about to start a uh, an Everglades uh, video program that Jake is going to be bit filming and producing for us. So today we have Jake Latondras. Jake, what's going on, man? It's good to have you here. Hey, Bill. How are you doing? Great. 
Good. Great. Thank you for having me. It's good to be here. Good to and see Jake, you. We talk on the phone a lot, and I don't get to see you that much, but it's good to see you finally. And Jake, I don't know how you're, you've are you been in Fort Collins for 35 years because you don't look a day over 35. So <laughs> since you spent time in Tennessee before that, you're doing pretty well, man, especially for owning Whoa. a bar. <laughs> <laughs> it's all that fat tire. <laughs> <laughs> there you yeah, go. I'm, I'm actually about to turn. I turned 53 in two days. So, wow. uh, yeah, I've got a Good few work. more years, 35 under, under my belt. Yeah. We, we actually went to, we went, I went to school with a lot of people that Jake played ball with. We went, we were too far apart to really know each other in school, but he played so, so much high level baseball. And I knew a few guys that did as well. I didn't non-athletic, but uh, yeah, that was, that was a common denominator. Once we figured out where each other was from, um, yeah, we, we found out we had some mutual friends that I played American Legion baseball with. Yeah. I still keep up with several of them too. The world indeed gets small sometimes. Mm. Uh, but let, let's kick it off right now with what we've been doing outdoors and, and Aaron, let's start with you, man. Well, maybe less than normal. Cause I spent four or five days in Kentucky wandering around a lot of distilleries and stuff, but we did get a little outside time there, but I guess the main outside thing I've been doing is uh, just fishing. the 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 fishing season here on my on my local river, the blue winged olives are are hitting. It's been a hurricane lately, unfortunately. I don't know. It's the, the spring is a windy time of year, and here in Colorado, it is just the whole state has just been overcome by high wind, high wind warnings, red flag warnings for like I don't know, Jake. You could you could say two up in Fort Collins, a couple couple weeks or so. It's been rolling. And it's still going to be going. So it's been slowing down the fishing a little, but uh, getting in when I can. Yeah, it's, it was windy when I left for the Bassmaster event at Chickamauga, and when I got back, it was still windy. And the turbulence on the airplane was tremendous. And just trying to just walking around town is 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 a chore in that kind of wind. It, it, you're right. It has been extremely windy. Well, I, I don't know about the wind in Colorado, but it's turkey season here, and that usually means a lot of wind uh, in Tennessee, and we've had some, some windy days. And, Jake, you were just at Chickamauga. I was turkey hunting over the weekend, doing a little crappie fishing. And uh, you can vouch for me that our weather has been neurotic uh, with – below freezing nights and i think sunday here it hit almost 80 degrees with about a 25 to 30 mile an hour wind uh, i'm not sure how it was in chattanooga except i'm sure it was even colder at night it was the same it was very cold we were bundled it was actually one of the most uh extreme event one of the events that i've i've faced most extreme weather conditions um, that we ever have, including Lake Ontario and Lake Erie and, you know, the Great Lake events, wow. that, that was rough. And we all, we all, you know, paid our dues for sure uh, <laughs> over a four day period. <laughs> then I come back to Colorado and it's nothing but dust. <laughs> <laughs> well, Bill, with your, with your Southern drawl too, when you first said neurotic, I thought you said erotic, which would have been really weird. So at least we're past that part. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm glad we didn't get stuck on that. Um, probably the wrong conversation for, for us or, and for this crowd. Yeah. But Jake, let's talk about where you are today. What's going on in your life? I mean, oh, man. you've got more I than mean, anyone that I know happening. I've, I'm in, I'm back in Fort Collins. I actually live in Timnath right outside of Southeast Fort Collins and I'm just here uh, with my kids. They're off there at school today, but um, I'm just spending some time at home. I've got about a month before the next uh, Bassmaster event. Of course, we have, you know, an event coming up, you and I do, um, in early May. So that's something I'm looking forward to. But right now, I'm just kind of catching up on administrative work and paying my taxes here in the next couple of days and getting through all that mess and, uh, just, you know, enjoying time with my family and my dog and sleeping in my own bed for a change. But, Not that I sleep around. I'm talking about hotels <laughs> on the road. <laughs> well, I mean, filming the Bassmaster events, uh, you know, you do a lot of traveling anyway, but how many of those do you actually film a year? And people need to understand that's a five day commitment basically for each one, right? Yeah. I mean, it's like, really, it's like, you know, a professional sports 
world, the professional sports world, it's really very similar where we have basically a full football season. You know, we have nine regular Bassmaster Elite events, and then we have the Bassmaster Classic. So that's 10 at that level. And, and then we have, we usually film two or three or four opens, a Bassmaster Opens, and then we cover the college national championship and the high school national championship. Plus, we cover the Red uh, Redfish Cup uh, each year too. So, I mean, it's a pretty much of a full time job, at least from a seasonal perspective. You know, you get two weeks between events, maybe uh, typically, but it seems like two days because the time just flies and then you're back on the road and you know you're on some new lake and it's five days in a hotel and on the water and and then you fly home for 10 days and then you're back on the road again so it's a pretty hectic schedule but i love it and at the same time okay you're a single dad with young kids who you love to get outdoors and do stuff with as much as possible you're you own a bar you uh you have latondra's media and that's how we work together uh, and then you also own prairie rock outfitters and so all of those are full-time jobs so i mean my question is how in the world do you balance this stuff i honestly don't know if i've i'm still searching for that balance <laughs> it's a it's a I mean, it is it is extremely hectic, but I read a book one time that, or like at least uh, parts of a book that Mark Cuban had written about being a business owner and, and an entrepreneur and how to succeed and, and how to how to manage all that stuff. And, you know, I'd read where he had owned over, over 300, uh, he had stock or equity in over 300 businesses and at that time it intrigued me like, okay, well, if he can do 300, I can do four or five. Right. (laughs) (laughs) And, and now that I'm involved in four or five, you know, businesses of my own, um, it is, it's hectic and it's all about hiring the right people, allowing people to the, the right people to do their job. And I have, uh, two really good business mentors that I seek advice from quite a bit. One being Bobby Martin, one of the owners at Greenbrier, Um, He's been vastly instrumental in advising me on how to manage all this, how to treat people, you know, how to apply yourself and get the most out of it. And and quite frankly, uh, one of the most important questions I asked him to validate things was, well, how, when you were in your, in your prime in your, in your, in the prime of your business life, he, he was the CEO of Walmart international for 29 years. And he's the one that took Walmart really all over the world. And so I trust him. And one of the values, uh, that, that I, that I thought about the most was how much sleep did you get per night when you were in your, in the prime of your business career? And he said three to five hours. And I said, okay, I'm doing it the right way then. (laughs) And that's about, that's about what I get each night is three to five hours. So it's just, it's just busy, man. And, you know, I'm a high energy person. So if I'm not doing that, I'm completely bored and I'm trying to find something to do. So I might as well be productive, you know. I thought you were going to say Mark Cuban's book just kind of prescribed it all for you. Like I read this book and I just had it figured out. I was like, what is it? Let's let's hear it because I bet everybody wants to read that sucker. No, he there. got me in trouble because he said he owned parts of 300 businesses and I thought I could handle four or five. It makes four or five sound easy and, and it's not, but you know, we all, we're all busy people and the older we get and the more adult we become, uh, the busier we get. Right. Yeah. I'm curious about kind of a day in the life on one of these tournaments or one of your assignments, but maybe we should start first. Cause I know we want to talk about this is kind of how in the heck you got started, you know, like where you grew up and what led you to the kind of the sporting media that you're in. Yeah. So, you know, my entire, my dad started taking, he, my dad was a commercial fisherman before I was born. So he, and, and he grew up in the outdoors, he grew up in South Dakota, you know, they hunted and fished for sustenance. I mean, they, they, they hunted and fished for food. And so that was really bred into my DNA as an outdoorsman and a, you know, a, a steward to the outdoors and all that stuff. And as I got older, um, I grew up in West Tennessee on Kentucky Lake. So I was always around, you know, high level hunters, high level bass fishermen. 
and it always intrigued me. Plus, I played sports, and I always wanted to be a professional athlete, just like any you know young young man. Um, and when that didn't work out, <laughs> I uh, you know I just started. I've always been into art, and I've always had cameras. And when I was young, I took a lot of photos of our hunting trips, so that I had something to remember. To, I had memories to to look back on. And as as one thing led to another, um, I was really wasting my time at UT in Knoxville. I mean, it was just too big of a school, way too much fun to have there. And the football team was great at the time, so I was having a lot of fun, but I was wasting my time and 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 scholastic money too. So I went to my advisor and. Uh, in Knoxville and asked him about a wildlife biology school where I could transfer to because at UT at the time I was studying wildlife management and that's not really what I wanted to study. I wanted to study the science of, of animals and wildlife. So he directed me to, to, to Colorado State University here in Fort Collins because of their natural resources program. So I transferred literally like Two months later, I was in Fort Collins looking for a place to live. And when I moved here, um, I've always been into sports and ath- athletics and, and all that. And I was looking for something to do here. And I met some people that were into rock and ice climbing. So I, hmm. I, I was like, yeah, I'll go and and fell in love with it, especially ice climbing. So I started climbing with this guy named Mark Wilford, who was uh, an ambassador to the Patagonia Apparel Company at, at the at the time. He still is, but uh, he's he's one of those Hall of Fame level climbers, and he kind of took me under his wing. And I think it was because I could take photos, so he would drag me along on these ice climbing trips, and I would take photos of him, and then he would send them to companies like Patagonia and the North Face and some other high profile, you know, outdoor apparel companies. And I finally got published on the cover of the North Face catalog, which was my very first published photo ever. And nice they start. sent me, yeah, it was a <laughs> nice way to start a career. Um, and and the, the, the funny story behind that was when I sent them the, the color slides, I did not send them a return address or a telephone number. Of course, this was before cell phones. This was in 1997, 98. And, uh, you know, there were no cell phones at the time. And they had no way of uh, getting back to me to get my approval on allowing them to print, publish the photo on the cover of their catalog. (laughs) Love it. But they took a chance and they printed it anyway, knowing that I would see it. And then I would come back and call, contact them to see what was up. And sure enough, another friend of mine who was a professional climber and a, a photojournalist came to the bar, the town pump, which I was just an employee in at the time. He throws the catalog on the bar and he goes, do you recognize that photo? And I immediately got angry. Like I was like, oh my God, I cannot <laughs> believe this company did that. So I go to a pay phone. I call the photo editor in at the North Face and I said, I want to know what's going on. And she says, hang on one second, Jake. You don't understand. We loved your photo so much. We wanted to put it on the cover, but you didn't send a return address or a contact number or anything. So we figured we would publish it. You would contact us afterwards and then we could settle, uh, make, you know, we could settle on everything. And they sent me a big fat check and a big f- box full of North Face gear. And literally, I used that money to upgrade my camera and I used the gear they sent me to stay warm in the mountains. And I continued shooting for uh, Patagonia for a few years. And then as the hunting video world began to evolve in the in the mid night early to mid 90s i thought that would be a really you know a really cool place to transition into and transcend photography into video so that's what led me into the hunting and fishing outdoor world that's awesome i love that story for two reasons one, because delayed reward is often a better reward, especially when you don't know that you're even going to get the reward. That was that was cool. And then second, just because that story could never happen anymore. Like there's just no way just that short nope. time ago and that just couldn't even happen anymore. That's it pretty was, cool. It was, it was meant to be. And like you said, the delayed reward was really 
it makes a better story. Like right now, like I'm glad, like when people, I can't wait for people to ask me how I got started because of that story, because it just happened. I mean, it was just like this serendipitous thing that really happened. I wasn't even looking for it. I just ran into the right people. I got lucky a few times. I was fortunately coordinated enough to, you know, to be able to ice climb at least behind someone that was really good at it to lead me down that road. So, you know, I felt, I feel very fortunate and lucky, um, that things happen the way that it did. But you, you definitely didn't uh, learn ice climbing in your childhood or in your youth. So, uh, no. but you that, know where I started, I started climbing. There was a, there's a bridge, uh, in Knoxville, just, uh, literally down the road from Neyland stadium and some climber friends, some caving friends of mine that were into spelunking had epoxied and, and bolted these rocks onto the concrete walls and the pillars under the bridge. And that was the very first time I'd ever tried, tried rock climbing, which is what kind of led me, you know, like made me excited to go out to Colorado in the first place. So yeah, it was all this you know, very, uh, full circle yet serendipitous, uh, series of events. Okay. Your dad made a living in the outdoors or some of his living in the outdoors anyway. And I mean, I see your family name and even the, uh, uh, fishing digest for Tennessee that I have that has all the rivers and everything. Latondra says fish a spinner bait here. And I mean, this is a 30 year old book, but I mean, your family is known for their outdoors, uh, lives here and was being full-time in the outdoors something like you dreamed of as a kid I mean I know you dreamed about being a professional athlete and that's definitely a better paying field but uh was the outdoors also in that yeah you know I mean I think I think one of the motivational factors that I had to bec- to do what I do now was okay I love this so much like I want to figure out a way to make a living in the outdoors so that I don't have to stop doing this. Not ever. Like I I didn't even want to go to bed at night knowing I had to go to work somewhere else and couldn't be involved in the outdoors. And I had to wait on the weekends to do so. I wanted to do it every day, all the time, full time, hundred percent committed to it. And, and it was all due to the fact that my dad raised me in the outdoors. I mean, you know, I, I went dove hunting when I was three years old. I went duck hunting when I was three year old, re, years old. And I don't, I know, I remember one time when I was a little boy that my dad went hunting without me. Every time from the day he took me to the day he passed away, when he went hunting, we went hunting together except for one time. And he went down on this little creek bottom called Eagle Creek, which you probably know down uh, on Kentucky Lake. Yep. And he found a, a wood duck hole that were, uh, these wood ducks were dry feeding in on a corn for dry cornfield. And he went down and shot his limit of wood. He loved to eat wood ducks. That was his number one table fare from the great outdoors were plucked whole roasted wood ducks. That, that was just it. So he shot his limit. They are hard came, to beat. They are. And he came home and I was crying when he got home because I was so hurt that he left me at home. Like it chokes me up now because my dad, he, he just meant so much to me. Right. So when he got home, he saw that I was crying and he pulled these wood ducks out of the truck. And I was like, Oh my God, those things are the, that's the most beautiful thing I've ever seen in my life. Like who made this? Right. And, and I remember (laughs) my dad told me when he got home and, and he saw how emotional I was about it. He said, son, I'll never, ever go hunting again without you. And I don't think he ever did. So yeah, to answer your question. Yes. It's, this has been, it's just in my DNA, just like it is yours. That's awesome. I mean, I, I, I had made a note. I wanted to ask you about your best story and I don't know, that might be the best story. So let me, let me reframe what I was uh, going to ask you. And he probably at, has a hundred good ones. We can, we can have a that, few. It's all right. Well, that's the very that's first true. time I've ever told that story ever. Like the only people that know about that are my dad who's passed away myself and you two, right? Like I've never told that to anyone and, and not because it was a secret, I've just never gone there before. And that's, which is really weird. 
Well, thanks for sharing that. That's cool. Yeah. Well, it is. And I, and I knew you and your dad were really close. I mean, we've talked about that before. Uh, at, at what point did, did you like break through, you know, growing up to where you were a, a sportsman in your own right? Did you wake up one day, you know, when was it that you looked at it and said, you know what, I'm, I'm actually doing this, not just the kid tagging along. I, you know, ironically, based on the story I just told you, there's a contrast to that because my dad was a high profile businessman in the pearl world. And he was, incidentally, he was the, he was the, the president of the Benton County Chamber of Commerce in, the, in 1969 when BASS came to Kentucky Lake for the very first time. And he was working with Ray Scott to make sure that they had everything they needed to make this event go down the right way. And so, you know, he's been a part like this is like it's so weird because my dad passed away before I started working for Bassmaster for Bass. And so the whole thing comes full circle. Um, Yet, in contrast to the story that I just told about the Wood Ducks, my dad was had a very high expectation for everyone not just me but for people that you know that that worked for him he put high expectations on himself but he also put very high expectations on me and my two sisters because he wanted us to be productive and accomplished and you know all the things that come with making your life fulfilling and and reaching your highest potentials yet I had some barriers with my dad because he wanted me to go down his road, which was the pearl farming uh, industry. And it's not something, it, you know, heck, it kept me out outside all day on Kentucky Lake. And we went to, you know, different bodies of water all over the country searching for the right uh, ingredients uh, to have a pearl farm. But it just wasn't my gig. I wanted to do something on my own. I wanted to create my own life. And so it was very difficult for me when I left to specifically answer your question. I think when I graduated from Colorado State, I went home for a year and I I hurt every day. I, I had a cabin at Beaver Dam on Kentucky Lake. I could spit in the water from my back porch. I mean, I had I had a sweet spot in the woods, on the lake, had a boat, had access to everything that I wanted in life, pretty much had a a future ahead of me that my dad was handing to me on a silver platter, but there was just something that wasn't right about it. And I think it was my climbing career at the time that pulled me back to Colorado. So it took me a full year to get the courage enough up to go to my dad and tell my dad that I was leaving home for good this time and I'm going to I was going to go back to Colorado and I didn't know what I was going to do but I was going to figure something out Um, so that was a very challenging and very difficult very emotional time because my dad and I were so close and he was I mean to say he was disappointed was is an understatement he was crushed by it and that hurt me but I knew that I needed to go out on my own to become my own man so you know, hopefully that answers your question there. <laughs> What's cool about it is that I feel like every time we get really accomplished people and particularly in the sporting community, I don't know what it is. Like there's always some, you know, bumps in the road, some things they had to overcome. There's always these, you know, little, <laughs> and it seems like that's what makes them who they are. And it kind of like galvanizes their, their desire, right? You have to kind of get through that to, to get where you're at. So I love that. I, I want to, if it's okay with you, Bill, I want to get, get into kind of like a day in the life, you know, cause you're out there, you do these tournaments, you know, what does that look like for you? I mean, it sounds pretty arduous, but you know, you're, you're there to capture kind of the, 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 the meat, I guess, if you would call it the, you know, the event itself, but there's all these ancillary things happening. There's probably cool stories, you know, do you kind of grab other stuff for use later in the, in your world? You know, I got like 20 questions. How are you going when you're going across the world? What are you doing in those places? How did you find those things? So maybe just start and I'll, I'll pick up where, where you, where I feel like it's necessary. Okay. Yeah. So in, in Bassmaster, the, the, the production values of Bassmaster have, have exponentially grown in the past five years, really six years, because we went from shooting 
B roll in the can and turning it into an edited production television show to live live streaming. Now we do, we do uh, two days, every event we have Saturday and Sunday, we have four hours where we shoot live for Fox sports. And then the other two days of the event and the other time around those live shows, we're shooting um, live on either bassmaster.com or Facebook or, you know, another platform. And so now the, the, the evolution of the digital streaming world has changed everything from being able to cherry pick what we could film, having to be active constantly to capture the moments that were, you know, spontaneous, yet not as intense because it wasn't live. I mean, the pressure of doing something live is, is, you know, way, way more, way more involved than a lot of people might think because it's the constant pressure of if you don't capture it, you missed it because it's live. You can't go time out. Let's do that over again. You know, you just missed it. And, and our responsibility as field producers for, for Bassmaster, we're, we're our own director, we're our own producer, we're our own uh, camera guy. You know, we're, we run audio. We're kind of a one man band on the back of the boat. And so our responsibility, these guys are professional athletes and they make way more of their living with sponsorship and endorsements than they do, you know, winning tournaments because I mean, let's face it, you know, to become a hall of fame angler in the bass fishing world, you, you know, you have to win. If you win one tournament every three years, you're probably on your way to the hall of fame. If you have a 20 year career um, and, and they lose, they lose more than, than baseball players don't get on base when, when they're at bat. So it, when they do get an opportunity wow. at something big, it's my responsibility along with nine other camera guys to capture that moment so that they get their glory. Even if it's two minutes of glory, that glory goes a long way with their sponsorships, you know, the, their, their fan base, their social media platforms, all that stuff. So we're constantly on our toes and, you know, we face, I mean, on a daily basis, we face, you know, 95 degrees at a hundred percent humidity in Texas or Tennessee in the summertime or where, or Alabama. Um, and then, you know, we may run up to the St. Lawrence river or Lake Oahe in South Dakota and face, you know, 50 degree changes in, in ambient temperatures, uh, on a daily basis and tornadoes and rain and sleet and hail and snow. So, you know, it, it is something, uh, I think the camera guys, and I won't speak for myself more than I speak for my teammates on the camera crew. These are unsung heroes. Um, and you know, at, at the end of the day, the anglers get up on stage and, and, you know, either they either take their lumps or take their earnings and they're off to the next tournament. We just go back to the hotel room, grab a bush light and a hamburger and go to bed and wake up the next morning, <laughs> and do it all over again. <laughs> so that's really, you know, that's really, uh, it's a, it's a traveling carnival. I call it NASCAR on the water because it's, it's very, it's a smaller scale, even though it's probably the largest in, single entity in the, in the outdoor world it's smaller than NASCAR, but it's, it's in a, from a cultural standpoint, it's very similar. But, you know, Jake, this kind of brings us to, to something. I, last week I was listening to a radio show on my way to the gym one morning and the people on there were talking about professional fishermen and it was a sports talk show. And they said, you know, it's not a sport. You see a fat guy sitting on the bank, uh, you know, anybody can do this fishing deal and, and there's nothing to it. And uh, all the, the, techniques and, and knowledge and all that aside you and and the pro that you're with talk about what that day is like when you start what you do i mean i i, I didn't have, I, I was waiting for him to give out the the number of the show because i was going to call and say you get in the dang boat with one of these people for four days and tell me it's not a sport so talk about that yeah you know i mean we build relationships with these anglers and in their world they're as big as, you know, Tom Brady and Peyton Manning are in the football world. They're as, they're, they're as big as, you know, Muhammad Ali and, and Mike Tyson were in the boxing world. And there's a huge fan base. 
And, and so, you know, when we, when we get in the boat with them, that's really their time to get away from people. They just get to go fishing. Of course, it's their job to perform on the water and to catch fish, bring the biggest bass to the scales that they can. Yet we have these personal relationships um, with these guys because we go through their experiences with them. And I don't mean, you know, we're not up there casting with them or, or, or grabbing the fish for them or helping them in any way, shape, or form. We're supposed to stay neutral, yet we go through the highs, the lows, and everything in between with these guys. So, you know, we become friends. I mean, we go to dinner with them. I go to concerts with some of them. They go, we go duck hunting together during the off season. You know, we truly become friends. And I think it's all based around the fact that we, we're the only other person on a boat with them when they bomb something, when they perform at their complete worst capabilities. Yet we're also the only person, like I was the only person on the boat with Jason Christie when he won the Bassmaster Classic this year, the Super Bowl of, of fish, of the, of water, of really the whole fishing world. And, you know, we have this bond between us that's, that's really unbreakable. Um, and, and because no one else knows what that was like to be there. He knows things that happened that he knows that I'm the only person that witnessed it with him. So, you know, it's, 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 it's truly, it's truly a, a, a building of friendships. You know, we do, we, we face some adversities. I mean, I've been on some really big water in some extremely dangerous and, and compromising and compromising situations with these guys. And again, it's not, it's not fishing. It's part of fishing, but you know, all, both of you guys know when you go through something dramatic, or traumatic with someone, you know, if you survive it, you're, you're friends for life. So that's what I get out of doing what I do. And over, this is my 12th season as a field producer for Bassmaster Elite. And so I've been there long enough now to pretty much know everyone. And I feel really comfortable around these guys because at first it was like, oh, my God, there's Kevin Van Dam. You know, what do I do? <laughs> right. Um, and now, you know, we're all just we're all just friends. And 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 that's how I look at it. Howdy, listeners. For more great content, check out NWF Outdoors social media on Facebook, Instagram and Twitter. Connect with us. We want to hear from you. Send us your ideas for podcast guests and questions in the comments. And for even more excellent content, here's a message from our partner podcast. Hey everyone, this is Marsha Brownlee from Artemis Sports Women. We know you love awesome stories about hunting, fishing, and conservation. So head on over to the Artemis Podcast. You'll meet adventurous, accomplished women who are redefining conservation through their lives in the field and on the water. Filled with humor, audacity, empathy, and intelligence, Artemis brings you new voices and introduces you to women from all walks of the sporting community. Find Artemis wherever you get your podcasts. Let's talk about some of the other stuff you, you've filmed over the years. I mean, you and I have never filmed fishing together um, other than during the kind Louisiana of, trip. Yeah. But, I mean, really gone out to film yeah. fishing on purpose. Um, that that was a conservation thing. But uh, we filmed some turkey hunting and some duck hunting and all. So you, you've been around and done a lot of things. Talk about some of the places you've been and, and people you've filmed for and some of the – I mean, you wrote a great article several years ago that I published when I was a magazine editor about a sheep hunt in Mongolia, Mongolia. Pakistan. Yeah. 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 So, I mean, I mean, to go back to the very beginning, the very first person that gave me a shot at this was Jay Gregory in the wild outdoors. And that was in, that was in 2000, the year 2000 or 2001. Um, I had, I had. Uh, moved out to Colorado, been there for a while, had learned about the North Platte River, had been hunting there for, you know, quite a few years. And I just finally realized, man, I could, I, I want to, I want to start, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to go buy a broadcast camera. I'm going to invite someone out that has connections into the industry and we're going to film. I'm going to give them my best spot and I'm going to film them you know, kill a deer, a big deer, and we're going to see where this goes. So 
I wrote, I was on a, a, a message, a, a talk, a chat room on Kiski Outdoors where it was very popular. You know, the, the juries were there. Uh, Jay Gregory was in there and a lot of people. And I had posted up a note that said, I'm looking for someone that wants to do this with me. I need a filming partner and a hunting partner. I've got plenty of property on the North Platte of, of, in Nebraska and, and I've got a camera. I spent $6,000 on a, a Sony PD-150, which was all on tape at the time. and I, Super I lightweight. It, super lightweight. I had a tree arm. Yeah. And, and <laughs> uh, I had everything I needed. Didn't really know what I was doing other than I was a photographer and I knew how to compose, you know, uh, frame a shot. And I felt like, well, man you know, video is just motion photography. So surely I can figure this out. So I got like 12 inquiries on my post on the Kiski board. And one of them was really intriguing. He was a writer named Clifford Names, who's from Pearl, Mississippi. He, he, he wrote me back in a private, in a private message and said, you know, I'm a, I'm a part-time writer for North American magazine, North American whitetail, Ma whitetail hunting magazine. Um, and, you know, I'd love to come up there and see what you got going on. So I invited him up. He showed up at two o'clock in the morning, drove all the way up from Mississippi. It was Halloween day at a full moon and took him to my favorite stand. And at like eight o'clock that morning, this humongous buck comes in, stands at 10 yards, rubs a tree. The sun is the sun color or the lighting was beautiful. There were the ripples on the water on the river were perfect. You know, the wind was blowing just enough to make the cattails look cool in slow motion. And this deer literally came up and, and put on a show for me. And I filmed the whole thing. He ended up shooting the deer. We recovered it, shot a recovery, sent the tape. He asked me after that, he goes, now, what do you want to do with this? And I said, I want to send it to Jay Gregory because I felt like at the time he was the, he was the world's best natural whitetail bow hunter. And, and his idol was Miles Keller, which was one of my idols as well. And I just feel like I would click with Jay. So we sent it to Jay he immediately called me and said, can you meet me at the ATA show this year in January? And I said, absolutely. So I flew to Indianapolis, met with Jay. At that, He took me into a, a bar that night. And I met Mark and Terry Drury, you know, uh, Lee and Tiffany Lakoski before she was, she was still Tiffany Profont. She was, no one even <laughs> knew who she was. You know, all, all, all those guys, all of them. Um, we're in the bar because there were there was a small much smaller world at the time, and Jay hired me and gave me a shot at being a producer for the Wild Outdoors, and I immediately contacted RNT Calls, uh, Rich and Tone Duck Calls, and said I want to talk to this guy, whoever this guy's name, Jim Ronquist. I need to talk to him. So they patched Angie Stevens, uh, the you know the wife of John Stevens, the owner of RNT patched me through to Jimbo and I said, Hey, my name's Jake Latondris. I've got a video camera. If I come to Stuttgart and give you two weeks of my time for free, as long as you feed me and give me a couch to sleep on, I'll film <laughs> for you for two weeks for free. And then we can talk business after that. And so he agreed to it. And that following December, I went to Stuttgart, met Jimbo and Jason Jaton. They were my first the first two people I met there and it was a, uh, the beginning of a 25 or 23 year love affair. And now, uh, as we speak today, Jimbo and I are the very best of friends. I bet that deal doesn't still apply the, the, on the couch. And the... No, yeah, no. <laughs> we, we graduated from the, from the entry level, uh, entry level uh job description <laughs> yeah although john would still take you up on it right john yeah. would yeah <laughs> and you hadn't read the um, cuban book yet so we know you didn't get it out of there that's right and really that's <laughs> what led into you know me knowing uh mr cooksey here um that's really what led me into uh meeting you at avery outdoors yeah that that's right because we were uh sponsoring rich and tones videos to begin with and then when rntv started and all that um we were there you know 
for all those beginnings, which was a cool time, you know, in that industry, it was a really cool time. Exactly. Lots of great people. Um, I, I'm going to ask you about another, uh, I don't remember the details, but I want to say it was about four years ago, maybe five years ago, you were hunting maybe in British Columbia or somewhere in, up north and you had a little incident on a horse yeah that was that was british columbia i was on a stone sheep hunt filming a, a private uh sector client from switzerland and uh we met we had met on i, I used to film for another tv show called sheep shape tv and this guy uh this european hunter was in camp um up in alberta in near Banff. Um, and I took some photos of him and I, I just emailed them to him. I just, I just, I like taking photos. So I take pictures of people and characters and all kinds of things. And I got his email from him and I literally sent him some photos without any business intent whatsoever. And he contacted me and said, these are incredible. Um, would you ever want to come join me on a hunt? And 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 film my hunt and do photos for me i said sure so we went on this british on this this was like our third hunt together we were in british columbia hunting for stone sheep it was nine days in um and his hunt was over he hadn't been he hadn't been successful on this trip in terms of harvest um so we were packing up leaving and to make a long story short, I got on my horse and I have, I don't, I'm not a horse guy. Like I don't own horses. I don't go out and ride. Like I'm not going to go ride after this podcast. Um, but I do have well over a thousand miles, you know, under my belt on horses in the mountains because I filmed so many goat and sheep hunts around the world. So I felt pretty comfortable. I rode across the river and we were staged across the river while the Wranglers were packing all the pack horses. And all of a sudden they turn all these pack horses loose. There were 17 of them. They all come barreling across the river at the same time. Like it was the Kentucky Derby. One of the pack horses came by me, hit one of the hard packs on a, on a, a pine tree that I was staged uh, next to. And it scared the crud out of my horse. She reared up on her back legs and started bucking. So I reined to the right and was riding her in circles, trying to ride it out and I think I held the reins too tight, too long. And she got, she freaked out, reared up on her back legs, came all the way over. I saw her head coming. And when I, when I saw her coming, I rolled to my left. She came down to my right and landed on my right leg and crushed it. I broke seven bones in my leg. And there I was sitting in, uh, in the mountains up near the Alaska <laughs> border, trying to figure out what I was going to do next. Well, what was next? You got to, you got to finish that part. How'd you get the yeah. heck out of there? <laughs> <laughs> the next move was grab my, I carry an expedition medical kit wherever I go. And I have, you know, I'm not, I don't want to incriminate myself, but I carry, you know, some pretty hardcore drugs in there in case I were ever in a situation like that. Um, and so I went in, I told them to go get my pack out of one of the med kits, get my, or one of the pack horse kits, get my med kit out and bring it to me. So my first, my first reaction was, oh, I'm okay. This is fine. I was like, wow, I, w- I could have sworn that was going to break my leg. <laughs> and, but it, it didn't feel like it did because I was in shock and I was numb. Right. And I, the first thing I did was I stood up and this white flash flashed over my eyes and I just fell to the ground, almost went unconscious, started throwing up um, because again, I was in shock. So I did have enough wits about me to to instruct them to get my medical kit. I took some painkillers and I'm a member of, um, you know, a rescue uh, club um, uh, that's world world renowned and i told them here take my my satellite phone go up to the top of that ridge and contact contact global rescue um to see what we have to do next so the next thing i know 45 minutes or an hour an hour and 45 minutes later i hear a helicopter come in and he lands in the rocks right next to me they load me on a helicopter they flew me back to d's british columbia um 
where, which is where uh, a logging, it's like the, the epicenter of the uh, logging industry. And there's actually a hospital. It's not even a town. It's just a gas station and like a, like a bar. And uh, they took me to this hospital and there was a, a doctor in there from South Africa who knew he was extremely good at what he did. Very caring. He did x-rays and said, yeah, yeah. <laughs> This is not good. You're going to have to have surgery. You need to get home as quickly as possible. I'm going to go ahead and put a hard cast on it so you can immobilize it. So then I got stuck. Then I had to I take, I took a 10 hour uh, truck ride in the back of a pickup. I had to hitchhike from Dees Lake, British Columbia to, uh, to uh, Whitehorse um, and where the nearest airport was. Right. And so I, I hitch a ride there. I get to a ho there's no hotel rooms and I'm staying in this motel, which was a complete dump. And it was like four days before I could catch a plane out of, out of Canada, back to, back to Seattle, back to Denver. Ooh. So I had, I called a cat, a cab driver and had him come to my room and asked him if he would, I gave him my, my, my debit card. I just had to trust the guy. I couldn't walk. And um, he went to a liquor store and got me two, two liters of fireball <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and two bags of groceries for the hotel room. And literally for the next four days, I sat in my hotel room and I was, I didn't have any more painkillers. Um, and so I had fireball and, and leftover pizza for the next four days until I could catch a plane out of there. That's how wow. I got home. Yeah. Something tells me you have a lot of stories like this, Jake. <laughs> I don't know what it is. I, <laughs> I know a guy Blaber. with some good whiskey who wouldn't mind sitting around a fire. Uh, yeah. <laughs> hearing a couple more of these. And one of the reasons I really remember that story, Aaron, and kind of takes us to, to the next topic really is at the time that that was going on, I was trying desperately to reach Jake because we were setting up a Washington, D.C. fly-in on behalf of the Mississippi River Delta. And I knew Jake was supposed to be back. And I'm like, where is this guy? Where is this guy? He, he never doesn't answer a text or, you know, a call. He, he's going to get back to me pretty quick. And uh, finally, I think somebody popped something up on Facebook maybe. And I was like, oh, my God. But we ended up making the fly-in. And uh, that was kind of a cool deal because one of the first people we talked to was Lamar Alexander, the Tennessee senator, and uh, who was head of appropriations at the time. So I was a good guy to talk to. And Senator Alexander remembered Jake's dad from some things they did together when he was the governor of Tennessee trying to bring Japanese businesses to invest in Tennessee. He brought my dad, you know, it being in the pearl business and his association to Japan uh, and the, the, the J Japanese business world, um, Lamar Alexander First of all, my dad was a lobbyist during the Ronald Reagan era, so he was good friends with Howard Baker, the chief of staff at the time, and Lamar Alexander, who was actually either the governor of Tennessee, and then after that became the, uh, he was the, uh, uh, what do you call it, the secretary, uh, he was the head of education on the at the federal level, right, director of education or whatever it is called, and so he started working with my dad on trying to bring Japanese businesses to Tennessee, just like Bill said. And they initiated the very first, um, uh, auto manufacturing, um, concept in, in Smyrna, Tennessee. So my dad was a liaison between Lamar Alexander and the Japanese business world. My mom was somewhat of a, a, a interpreter in, in the language barrier. And that's really how the automobile um, industry came to Tennessee in, in the first place. So yeah, there, and wow. Lamar was very good friends with my dad. I'd met him when I was a little boy. And I remember telling you when we were approaching him in the, in the handshake line, that this is going to be interesting. And he made me cry because he was telling me very quickly some, you know, short stories and how much he appreciated and respected my dad. So that was, that was a really cool thing um, that we did in Washington. That is cool. Well, we'd be, I, I know you got to go soon, Jake. We'd be remiss if we didn't talk a little conservation. You've been helpful on, on some conservation campaigns and, you know, I'll let Bill kind of jump to that, but 
cool stories and, <laughs> and, uh, and I just appreciate you coming on and it's cool to kind of get to know the story behind town pump and a little bit there. And it's been kind of an institution in Fort Collins. I just always sitting there, been in there a bunch of times myself and here, here's the guy. So uh, just thank you. And I, I know you got to get going, but let's talk conservation. Let's, let's, you know, first, if you can just start with kind of how you started, you know, I mean, obviously life in the outdoors, but you know, when's the first time you were like, man, I gotta, I gotta give back to this. I gotta take care of these places. That, that's a great question. I have a really solid answer for, you know, my dad being in the pearl industry and, and the muscling industry, my dad worked very closely with TWRA, the Tennessee Wildlife Resources Agency at the highest level, because he was, he started the muscling industry in, in North America. And one of the things that was going on was over harvest and these mussel shells were being sent to Japan to, to be created into mother of pearl beads to become the nucleus or nuclei or the seeds for cultured pearls all over the world. Like 85% of all the, sh the, the pearl material that's used to grow cultural pearls around the world, 85% of it comes from the Mississippi River and its tributaries, including the Tennessee River. And so my dad has always been um, tightly woven into the TWRA, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, the Corps of Engineers, all those entities that have control over the variables on different bodies of water around the country. Plus, he was a sustenance hunter and fisherman. So, he instilled in me very early at a very early young age that, you know, to be a good hunter and to be a good fisherman, you have to be a good steward and a good conservationist first, because without the resource, if you don't take care of your resource, you have nothing. You have absolutely nothing except a lake to look at that's dead, right? So my dad pushed conservation on me pretty hard from um, of, at a very young age, and it's something that I've always felt um, compassionate about. I've always felt like I don't throw, I've never, I never throw my trash out the window. Of course, most people don't now, but even as a young boy, when a lot of people did, you know, when I walk by a piece of trash, I pick it up. If I see broken glass uh, along the lake shore, I pick it up. Um, so, you know, even in the simplest form of conservation and being a good steward to natural resources, um, it's very, very important to me. And at the end of the day, what I try to, the message I try to get across in almost everything that I do at some point is if you even, even hunting big game around the world, like the conservation principles and the business models they use to, to charge wealthy, you know, uh, Western men for a, a sheep hunt in Mongolia might cost $150,000. People think that's insane, but the few tags that they sell, all that money goes back into the wildlife conservation for those sheep who were almost extinct at one point in time. So these, all these things are, are, you know, they're lead ins, circle backs and follow-ups on things that my dad taught me when I was a kid and being around TWRA my entire life uh, meant a lot to me. And I suppose, you know, I'm in that stage of my life now as a hunter and fisherman, I really don't even care if I, if I harvest another animal, but I do want to take care of them and preserve them for the youth of our, our, of the world and in particular our country, my son, my son's friends, kids that I don't know, all that stuff because everyone deserves to at least have the opportunity to understand what the great outdoors are all about. Oh man. Well, I, and I appreciate that. I mean, and Aaron, you'll know how challenging this can be when I got the, a list of the States we needed to find sportsmen from to go to DC. And that was the first fly in I ever helped put together, but it had Colorado on there. And I said, man, I know the guy, if he can make time to go. And when I got, got him on the phone. He was recovering from that uh, horrible event in British Columbia, but he immediately said, I'm there. What, whatever you need, um, I'm there. Love it. So Jake, I, I'm going to hit you with kind of a, maybe it's a two part, but it, maybe not. Um, you're a father who cares about his kids growing up and, and caring about the outdoors, but you're also a person who, and these are the stories I always love. You know, you told us about how you grew up and all and your path to, 
becoming you know a professional in in the outdoor world what advice would you give to both kids who have that as a dream and, and obviously there are a lot of paths to getting there or to parents who are hoping that their kids will take a similar path great questions first of all i just watched a movie on the plane coming back from chickamauga from chattanooga to uh denver called the alpinist never never didn't it it's it's a, it was a follow-up after um the movie free solo that won all the academy awards is a documentary tremendous movie and so i was intrigued by the alpinist and it's about this young man who was very different i don't know if he had asperger's or autism or something he's very different but very driven and very motivated and very like insanely acute um acutely uh aware of his own skills and he did these really crazy alpine climbs all over the world by himself unroped that people with ropes wouldn't even attempt to do. And one of the things at the end of the movie um, that his mother had conveyed in the documentary was one thing that Mark taught me as a child. I knew he was different, but I didn't know how different and I would have never discovered how different he actually was had he not taught me to not stand in the way of my child and his dreams, no matter what it was. So speaking out to the parents out there, you know, don't force your children to do what you want them to do, support what they want to do because they're probably good at it because that's what leads them into wanting to, to do what they do and don't stand in their way. Allow them to be free and and go down the road because that's a way that's a way better feeling for a young person to feel free to be able to 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 work freely opposed to feeling boxed in with all the pressure and expectations that someone else has for you as far as young people go never ever give up you know find my brother told me this one time he said talking about his own children he said I just want them to find to, to like find something they love to do, and then once they find something they love to do, then do everything that you can to be really, really good at it. And if you do that, everything else will fall into place. Most importantly, you're going to be happy in life. And as, as cliche as it is, that transcends itself into the old cliche of, you know, if you're if you're doing something you really love to do, you never have to work a day in your life. So that's my advice to parents and to the youth of, of the outdoor world. <laughs> that That's pretty strong right there. Um, yeah, we were and, just sitting on that for a second. That was yeah, like, hello. <laughs> well, the whole time through, I'm thinking, you know, I, I, you talked earlier about your dad, how disappointed he was, you know, when you didn't get into the pearl industry and, and um I feel pretty confident that uh, your dad's pretty proud today. So, well, thank you. I, yeah, that means a lot. Well, all right, we're we're gonna have to wrap this thing up. But uh, before we do, uh, start with Aaron. Aaron, do you have any words of wisdom for us before we get out of here? No, just appreciate the conversation, Jake. Let's let's connect. You know, we're not too far apart. Let's fish or do something. Uh, be good to be good to hear a couple more of these stories. I probably got a couple that are at least entertaining. I could tell you, um, uh, and and yeah, let's let's do it. And thank you for all your time and 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 what you're doing on conservation. I think if you get a chance, real quick here, Bill, you should do a little shout out to this video project you guys are working on together. But uh, just thank you and happy trails. Hope our paths cross. Thank you for having me, Aaron. Yeah, let's uh, let's go have a have a, uh, an adult beverage sometime at the town pump, a little watering hole that we both know very well. Yes, sir. I get through town. I'll, I'll, I'll get in touch. Sounds good. I, I want to be there for that meeting. And, Come uh, on. you know, as, as we mentioned earlier, um, uh, early May, Jake and I'll be together down in South Florida with a bunch of hunters and anglers, uh, filming to talk about the issues for sportsmen in South Florida and the Everglades. So we'll have bass fishermen, saltwater fishermen, duck hunters, so that's something uh, uh, before too long you'll be able to check out on NWF Outdoors and on Vanishing Paradise, I'm sure. I just want to say one last thing about that, too. When you had mentioned to me the Everglades, an Everglades project, you didn't I, I didn't know anything about it. You just mentioned the Everglades and, you know, 
this is a dream come true for me, right? I mean, I've done a lot of things. Like you said, I've been all over the world and filmed a lot of things. The Everglades, for some reason, has always been a bucket list and a big part of my childhood dreams just to go see it, be a part of it. I've seen it, but not like we're going we're to see it from the inside out. So I really appreciate you guys including me in on this. And it's something that my heart is committed to and I'm very compassionate about. And I cannot wait to get down there and start filming this project. I could say the same thing. It's a dream for me too. So, you know, Bill, you have my contact info. Maybe I can get a, a nice invite in the mail or something. Hey, I'll, I'll shoot you an email this afternoon. Come on with us. We could, we could use another body for sure. <laughs> well, Jake, thanks for being with us. And, uh, um, I really appreciate your time and, and Aaron, come on, man, take us out. Like you always do. You have the best ending ever. All right, fellas. Well, just thanks. That's the main thing we usually say and just keep doing what you're doing for conservation. Thanks for listening. For more great content, check out NWF Outdoors social media on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Connect with us. We want to hear from you. Send us your ideas for podcast guests and questions in the comments. We are NWF Outdoors. <laughs>